So um, Cynthia um, is working as a postdoc in the transplantation uh, immunology group of uh, Dr. Sebastian Haidt at the Department of Immunology at the Leiden University Medical Center, LUMC in the Netherlands. Um, she obtained her PhD last year, 2020, on HLA epitope matching in clinical transplantation under the supervision of um, Franz Klaas, Sebastian Haidt and Dave Rowland. Um, uh, actually, interesting thing, I did my, many, many years ago, I was doing um, my PhD where Dave was doing a postdoc here in Oxford. So um, it's great to have a kind of a link that, that kind of continues there. Um, the focus of Cynthia's research is the definition of immunogenic HLA epitopes and the generation and characterization of human recombinant monoclonal HLA class two antibodies. So Cynthia, thank you very much for speaking and we're very much looking forward to hearing your talk today. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy, for the introduction. Do you see my slides? Okay, cool, thank you. So indeed, today I would like to talk about the generation and reactivity analysis of human recombinant monoclonal antibodies directed against epitopes and HLA DR. Oh, it does not work. Yeah, so um, kidney transplantation is the only treatment for end stage kidney disease. So, to give you an indication, over 10,000 patients are currently waiting for a kidney transplantation with Euro transplant and only uh, 2,850 patients received a kidney from a deceased donor in 2020. So there's still room for improvement. Uh, to allocate a kidney, various factors are included, such as waiting time, disease, etc. But one of the most important factors for allocation are actually the immunological uh, factors uh, to prevent rejection after transportation. Because it was already observed in the early 60s by Professor Jon Verroot that the human leukocyte antigens, also known as HLA or MACs, uh, play a very important role in a successful outcome of kidney transportation. So just briefly to explain what are these HLA, we have two classes, HLA class 1 consisting of HLA A, B and C, and then we have HLA class 2 consisting of HLA DR, DQ, DP. And uh, these HLA molecules are involved in the immunological defense against pathogens. And as a result, there's a high diversity of HLA to ensure that there's always an individual that uh, can present the peptide of a particular uh, pathogen. However, a consequence of that is while this is good for our immunological defense, this high polymorphism makes it very difficult to find an HLA matched uh, donor within kidney transportation. So uh, currently the majority of patients receive an HLA mismatch graft, which is associated with a worse graft survival, as you can see in this figure. And this is uh, despite the presence of efficient immunosuppression, indicating that there's still something going on that causes this rejection. So what actually happens? So the patients receive an HLA mismatch graft indicated here in this figure by donor one um, with an HLA DR7. And then the patient can recognize this DR7 as foreign and start developing antibodies directed against this DR7 molecule. And as a consequence, various pathways are induced and resulting in rejection and eventually graft loss. So as a consequence, these patients require a new transplantation because it lost its first transplant. However, the presence of these HLA antibodies actually complicates finding a new transplantation. How does it work? So for example, if this patient received a new uh, kidney from donor two with a different DR molecule, in this case, DR9, what can happen is that the HLA antibody directed against DR7 can also bind to DR9 because HLA antibodies can be cross-reactive. And as a result, this new transplant can then also be uh, rejected. How does this come? Well. As I said, these HLA antibodies are cross-reactive because HLA antibodies recognize an antigen uh, determinant that is shared by the different HLA molecules, or what we nowadays call uh, epitopes. So as you can see here. So to visualize that more clearly, I show you here in a schematic overview of various HLA antigens. And as you can nicely see, each HLA antigen has a unique set of epitopes, so making this antigen unique. But a certain uh, epitopes can be present on other HLA antigens. For example, you clearly see that HLA antigen 1 in this example have four different shapes that is unique from the other antigens. However, the star is uh, present on HLA antigen 1 is also present on HLA antigen 2 and 3. 
So if you then compare the different HLA antigens, you see that they are not always um, so different or alike. So for example, HLA antigen 1 compared with HLA antigen 3 only has one epitope mismatch. So this ones, these ones are very alike, while HLA antigen 1 compared to HLA antigen 4 has three epitope mismatches, indicating that's highly different. And various studies have shown that indeed the number of epitope mismatches correlates with the development of these antibodies after transportation. However, not every epitope will result in an antibody um, response. So therefore, because we see that there's an interest in this epitope matching, we think it's essential to define which of these HLA epitopes can be recognized by these HLA antibodies. Why do we want to do this? Because we want to implement epitope matching in the clinical transportation rather than this antigen matching to increase the chance of finding a suitable donor, but also to prevent antibody formation after kidney transplantation by avoiding these immunogenic epitopes on the mismatched donor HLA. But also for the patients that already developed an antibody, so the highly sensitized patients. And I have to mention, not only previous transplantation can induce an HLA antibodies, but also blood transfusion and even pregnancies results in the development of HLA antibodies. So for these patients, we can then predict what, what are the acceptable HLA mismatches and therefore increasing the pool of their potential donors for these patients. So, as I so for this, we want to define these HLA epitopes. And I have to mention, we are focusing in this story on the B-cell epitopes because we are, of course, uh, looking at what is recognized by the antibodies. So how can we do this, the definition of these HLA epitopes? Well, the past has already shown that human monoclonal antibodies are very useful for this type of analysis. However, currently, uh, the majority of human monoclonal antibodies against HLA are against HLA class 1. So there are currently a limited number of HLA class 2 monoclonal antibodies available. However, uh, HLA class 2 antibodies are the most observed after transplantation. So therefore, the aim of this study was to generate uh, human HLA-DR specific monoclonal antibodies from HLA-specific memory B cells by using tetramers and recombinant technology, so that we could then perform reactivity analysis of these recombinant human HLA-DR specific monoclonal antibodies to identify uniquely shared amino acid configurations, so that we could define the immunogenic epitopes that are recognized. So how did we do this? So the first step was to isolate HLA-specific memory B cells from immunized individuals. For this, we used peripheral blood of immunized individuals, and the current study is focusing on pregnancy immunized individuals, of which we then isolate B cells, which were then stained with a number of uh, detection antibodies for C3, CD27, and IgG. And of course, the HLA-DR-specific tetramers that we uh, obtained from pro-immune. And I think it's interesting to mention, so in previous talks, we have seen that these HLA tetramers are very useful for uh, the detection of antigen-specific T cells, but we are not interested in the peptide that is presented by these uh, HLA molecules of these tetramers, but the HLA molecule molecules itself to see if we could uh, isolate uh, memory B cells that have a B cell receptor that can bind to the HLA molecules of these tetramers. So once we stained our B cells, we go to the flow cytometry to sort on uh, memory B cells based on CD27 positive and IgG negative expression. And then those memory B cells were then uh, gated on the cells that were double positive for HLA-DR tetramers. And you can see this is only a small population. These cells that we call HLA-specific memory B cells were then single cell sorted and expanded over time, after which we first detect whether there was any antigen production in the supernatant using a total IgG ELISA. And this was the case in around 50% of the cells that were sorted. And then the next step was to determine if these antibodies were indeed HLA-specific. And uh, this was then the case for around 38% of our B cell clones. So now we have the HLA-DR specific B cell clones from immunized individuals, and then we use the recombinant technology to develop um, the human monoclonal antibodies. And I will not go into detail about those, that method, but I would like to show you some data on, on some of the monoclonal antibodies that we have developed. 
So from now on, I show you uh, data on five HLA-DR7 specific monoclonal antibodies that were obtained from one individual during one sort using a DRB10701 tetramer. So here you see uh, a heat map of the single enzyme beat uh, assay that we use. This is a standard uh, assay for the diagnostics to detect uh, HLA antibodies in sera. So I will briefly explain uh, how this works. Here on the bottom, you see all the different DR alleles that are present on a single beat in the assay. And if an antibody is present in the sera, then it will bind to the beat, and then you will get a mean fluorescence intensity value, which is indicated here by the colored scheme. So this is the serum of the individual of which we have isolated these monoclonal antibodies, and you can see that this is a very narrow uh, HLA antibody pattern. If we then look at the first uh, HLA antibody reactivity pattern of the antibody LBDR7A, you can nicely see that there's this, this antibody is only reactive to one HLA, in this case, DR7. But we developed uh, four more monoclonal antibodies from this individual, and you can see different uh, specificities. So we have two monoclonal antibodies, LBDR7B and D, that besides DR7 are also reactive for DR9. And then we have also LBDR7C and LBDR7E that are reactive besides DR7 for the DR12 uh, HLA alleles. So this already shows that the reactivity pattern that is observed in the of an individual consists of different clones that uh, generate different types of HLA antibodies recognizing in different epitopes. So this is a beat assay, but we also want to confirm whether these HLA monoclonal antibodies can also bind their uh, HLA target expressed on cells. So for that, we performed a flow cytometry assay uh, in which HLA-specific B cell lines were incubated with our monoclonal antibodies. And you can nicely see here in the histogram, which is a cell line for the DRB10701, that all five monoclonal antibodies are nicely binding to the uh, cell. However, they do this with a different binding strength. And you can nicely see on the bottom, there's an, we took along a different monoclonal antibody that should not bind to this cell, and this was indeed negative. So this confirms the binding of our monoclonal antibodies to the HLA target expressed on cells. So the next step was uh, the, to check the functionality of our monoclonal antibodies because we have generated IgG1 monoclonal antibodies. So we wanted to confirm their complement dependent cytotoxicity assay uh, by incubating our monoclonal antibodies at various concentrations, again with an HLA specific B cell line. And here you see the data of a cell line that is, a, uh, that is specific for DR7. And you can nicely see that indeed our five monoclonal antibodies uh, have an uh, dose dependent uh, um, effect on cell lysis. So you see a higher amount of cell lysis with a higher concentration of monoclonal antibodies. So this indicates that indeed our monoclonal antibodies can induce complement dependent cytotoxicity. But again, you see clearly that there is a differences within these five monoclonal antibodies that we have generated. So uh, because we obtained the sequence uh, uh, data of our monoclonal antibodies, we were interested in to see, okay, so what is the VDG uses of our monoclonal antibodies? And are these monoclonal antibodies uh, uh, originated from the same or different precursor clones? So here you see a table of an overview of the VDG uses. So in the first column, you see the VDG genes from the heavy chain. And here you see the genes from, for the light chain. And if we compare the five uh, monoclonal antibodies, what we noticed straight away was indeed all the VDG uses was different for all our five monoclonal antibodies. So just to specify this more clearly, here you see the same monoclonal antibodies that have the same reactivity. So they were specific for DR7 and DR12. And, in, and nicely, you can see that their clono, um, that their VDG genes are completely different. So indicating that they are from unique clone types. So this is uh, more about the generation of these monoclonal antibodies. But as I mentioned, we are interested to see, can we define the epitopes that are recognized for these uh, antibodies? So for that, it's, I think it's important that we distinctly distinct two, uh, two types of uh, the properties of the B cell epitopes. So because an, um, the footprint of an antibody is quite large and, and covers a large part of the HLA molecules. So 
what we do is we distinguish uh, two different things. So the first part is actually what is the functional or also known as the immunogenic epitope of our antibody. What this means is what were the amino acids, uh, configurations that induce this antibody response and determine the specificity of the antibody. Because this amino acid configuration uh, uh, interacts with the CDR3 of the heavy chain of the antibody. As indicated here, you see a schematic overview of the footprint of an antibody with the different CDR uh, sites. But it's all, of course, we already have the antibodies already formed, so it's also important to consider the whole B cell epitope or structural epitope, because other amino acid configurations can be involved in the binding of the antibody uh, to the HLA molecule. So then how do we perform these reactivity analysis? I will show you here an example from our LBDR7A monoclone antibody. And in figure A, you see again the data of the single antigen beat assay, but this time it is presented as a table. So you see them in five values and the reactive antigens. So as I said, the specificity of an antibody is uh, determined by an amino acid configuration that has to be unique for the antigens that are reactive versus those that are non-reactive. So what we did is we compared the amino acid sequences of those alleles that were reactive for the monoclonal antibody versus those uh, versus the non-reactive alleles. And in this example, you nicely see that there were four amino acids that were unique uh, for the DR7 and absent on all other HLA alleles. So then if we look at um, the molecule structures of DR7, in figure B, you see the top of an HLA molecule. In light blue, you see the uh, alpha chain, and dark blue is uh, the beta chain, and in gray, you see the peptide of this HLA molecule. And in B, you can nicely see that position 30 and 11 are located in the peptide binding growth. So therefore, for, we think it's very unlikely that this antibody is binding to these amino acids. However, in figure C, you can nicely see that positions 25 and 14 are first of all located near each other and at the back of the, of the molecule, indicating that they are accessible for the antibody. So for this monoclonal antibody, we defined the epitope that is recognized as a uh, lysine on position 14 and, and glutamine on position 25, and they can form together the functional epitope of this antibody. So, just to finish this uh, whole story, I would also like you the definition of the epitopes for the other monoclonal antibodies of DR7. So first the LBDR7B and DR7D, which were uh, reactive for DR7 and DR9. And for these monoclonal antibodies, we actually identified a two unique amino acid configuration. As you can see, one of those is located on the top of the molecule as indicated in figure F. And the other configuration consisting of three amino acids are located near the bottom of the HLA molecule in figure G. So for this monoclonal antibody, we cannot uh, define what is the epitope that is recognized uh, by this antibody because these positions are located too far to be part of one antibody footprint. And for this question, we uh, require crystal structures to really see what the antibody binds to. Then for the other two monoclonal antibodies, LBDR7C and E, uh, this monoclonal antibody recognizes uh, an, uh, two amino acid configurations that are essential for the binding of this antibody. So you see that positions uh, 57 and 60, which are located, as you can see in figure H, on the top near the peptide uh, binding roof. And uh, we noticed that the position 71 and 70 are essential also for the binding. So this is an, an epitope that consists of two configurations, but they are located with the antibody footprint. So this is uh, an example of one of the monoclonal antibodies that we have generated using only one tetramer from one individual. But we've been able to uh, generate a large amount of different monoclonal antibodies using the different HLA DR uh, tetramers that we have obtained uh, from proimmune, and you can see the large priority of uh, the specificities that we have generated in this table. And that's only from five different uh, or six, what is, yeah, five different uh, tetramers. So to conclude, um, we can generate recombinant human monoclonal HLA DR specific antibodies from single memory B cells isolated from peripheral blood using these HLA specific tetramers. We see that we obtain different B cell clones from one individual with one tetramer. 
And the monoclonal antibodies with different reactivity patterns can be generated from one individual. So the antibody reactivity analysis led to the identification of uniquely shared polymorphic amino acid configurations, and this correspond to known epitopes within the field of HLA. And then we can consider, and we call it now considered as antibody verified. So that means that indeed these epitopes are uh, relevant, and we should consider those when we do our matching of our patient and our donor. However, uh, our, day, our study also showed that sometimes we have reactivity patterns that are inconclusive due to, due to the presence of multiple unique amino acid configurations. And this type of analysis require a little bit more in-depth uh, studies, such as the use of crystal structures. So this is one purpose, uh, uh, one of the, re, uh, one, so we generated these monoclonal antibodies for the verification and definition of these epitopes. However, of course, the recombinant human HLA monoclonal antibodies can be used in various applications, especially because we use a recombinant technology, we can make all uh, IgG subclasses uh, if required. So with that, I would like to thank everyone involved in this project, especially the supervisors, Dave Hoele, Frans Klaas and Sebastian Heidt, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, Cynthia. Um, that was really great. Um, we have a question and you may have already touched on the answer, but um, Amy Rosenberg. Amy, would you like to ask your question verbally? I don't know if you can unmute. Sure, thank you. Um, I wondered what, um, uh, what the antibody isotypes were, if there was a spectrum of them or if they were uh, in, in a narrow uh, uh, classification. Um, we use an uh, uh, array PCR that focusing on the first part of the IgG1 uh, constant domain. So we obtain the variable domain uh, of the B cell clones, uh, the, so the genes, uh, and we generate, first of all, an IgG1. So, but we did not really check. So it could be that there are other IgG isotypes, but we assume that they are uh, IgG1. if that answers your question. Great, <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Amy, for the question and, and Cynthia. Um, so I, I was just thinking about, obviously in, in the past, in, in regards to all the matching of, uh, of organs and, and having to pre-screen donors um, and recipients for their, for their sera, I guess there were some pretty old school methods in regards to just using sera rather than obviously monoclonals. And I had the privilege of going to a, a group um, based in Kiel and this was many years ago, and they used a card system where they basically stuck, they had uh, had cards listing all the different um, anti uh, HLA antibodies in the sera of these of these samples that had been stored down, and they had a little clip on the on the top of the card marking this specific HLA type, and then you stick your metal pole through the through the card system in this filing cabinet, you pick them up, and then you just shake, and then the card that you everything all the cards fall away and then you're left with the donor and the sample that you want in your freezer that you actually want to use as a, as a way of screening which is very very old school but kind of worked but obviously here you've got a, an, an amazing approach for being able to do that so thinking thinking forward obviously you've got a, an existing set of antibodies against a range of hla class two what about um um other loci i mean obviously dq dp sometimes making the emultimas for for those um, loci can be quite quite challenging. Um, is that something that you're kind of interested in moving into or is it just focusing on DR to start with? Uh, no, so I have to admit, uh, we've had to refer to other companies for the DQ. So we're now using some monomers mm -hmm. and we have been successful in those as well. Um, um, so far, what is available, so especially, yeah, we have talked about this before, DQ monomers are slightly more difficult, difficult because the molecules are less stable. Uh, but we have now those as uh, that system running as well but that means that we have to do a secondary staining so it is um it is slightly different we also think uh you know the difference between the monomer uh, the beta clones that we isolate using monomers versus tetramers will probably be slightly different due to the affinity um but we are using now both just to see if we can indeed get a panel um of monoclonal antibodies to see indeed what is recognized um, by these antibodies, because that's so important also to rec to analyze serum of patients that have these antibodies, you know, so that we could uh, treat them be better and find suitable donors for future. So, yeah. <clears throat> Great. Well, let's stay in touch about that. I think we'll be able to help you uh, soon enough. Um, Derek, uh, Derek Doherty, do you have a question? Yes. Um, very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, 
does the epitope specificity of the anti-DR antibodies depend on the bound peptide? And, and if it does, that would be expected to give a very large range of epitopes for every HLA-DR molecule. Yeah, that's a, a good point you, you, you say. Um, uh, there was someone within our group a long time ago that has looked at the role of peptides for HLA class one monoclonal antibodies. And for some there was, and others not. Um, I think it's important that we uh, should consider what it does, uh, what the effect is of the peptide that's bound to the, uh, to the surface of the molecule, of course, because it makes influence the accessibility of these epitopes towards the antibodies. So far within our research uh, study, so the different monoclonal antibodies against DR that we've developed, we, we see the epitopes located all over the molecule. So it doesn't really seem to be influenced by the peptide. But of course, this is very limited to what's available in materials and the patients. So we are combining this antibody project with like cohort studies to really see what are the epitope mismatches between patients and donors and then the antibodies developed there. And can we indeed see, is there certain regions of the molecules that induces these epitopes? And there is a software program from the group in Cambridge that really considers the surface potential of the molecule. So really um, taking along the side chains, so the properties of the side chains in the induction of an antibody response. And of course, also the antigenicity of an antibody. And I take it there was no peptide bound to your tetramers that you used to detect the antibodies? So the DR7 that Tetramers we've used had actually a CMV peptide. And for all the others, we got a clip uh, peptide in a Tetramer. So we think it should not give us any problems with uh, the, the B cells that we uh, isolated. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Derek. Uh, any other questions at all? I don't think so. Well, um, thank you very much indeed, Cynthia.